Okay, peeps, welcome back. So we have an important topic that we're going to discuss today. That is the CPI release that's coming out tomorrow morning at 5.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, or if you're on the East Coast, it would be 8.30 a.m. East Coast Time in the United States, and how it will affect investors and dividend investors in general. Let's get it. So as you guys can see here on the BLS or Bureau of Labor Statistics.gov website, we have a release date tomorrow for September 13th, 2023 at 8.30 a.m. Again, this is Pacific Standard Time, which will show the numbers for the August 2023 Consumer Price Index. Basically, this is the measurement of inflation. Why is inflation so important right now? Well, the reason why it's important is because the Fed has been raising rates for nearly 18 months to bring inflation down to their 2% target. And they're not going to stop cut. They're not going to stop raising rates, and they're not going to be cutting rates until they get that number to where they want it to be. They've literally said this every single FOMC meeting that's happened, basically, for the longest time. Okay. So let's take a look at this article here by CNN Business. Um, just my personal bias. I'm not a big fan of CNN, but this was probably about the most accurate thing I could find. Um, as you guys can see, it was uploaded September 12th, 2023. It says, this week's U.S. inflation data is very important, and here is why. So we'll scroll down here. It says, markets hate uncertainty, which is true. They do hate uncertainty. I can tell you that right now um, from my many years of experience in the markets. Um, and there's a lot of it this fall. The United Auto Workers Union may strike on Friday. The federal government is heading towards another potential shutdown in October. Geopolitical tensions with China remain heightened and oil prices could stay elevated through December. Basically what they're talking about here by um, heading towards another potential shutdown in October is the debt ceiling would need to be raised again. I'm not sure if that's what they're talking about here, but if it is, uh, it wouldn't surprise me because they do it roughly every two years. They have this conversation in Congress where they're basically like, oh, yeah, we got to raise the debt ceiling because if we don't, we're going to default. And then if you guys saw in my Black Swan video where I talk about Fitch downgrading the credit rating of the United States from, I believe it was AAA to AA plus, you would understand why this is important. Uh, so the next piece is the geopolitical tensions with China, basically what's going on with China and the United States is the United States came out and basically said, hey, we think you're trying to steal our proprietary technological information here in the US, so we're gonna ban you from doing business here. And by the way, um, we're not going to, we're not. We're basically not gonna allow you to do business. We're gonna start delisting your stocks from our exchanges and so on, so on. And so China retali retaliated, of course, in like kind. That's basically what happened with that. Um, oil prices, I will go over later with you guys in the charts, but basically oil is taking off for the moon right now, just like it did last year. So it goes on to say there is also the looming question about whether the Federal Reserve will hike interest rates again. All this uncertainty has led markets to lack conviction, flip-flopping as conflicting narratives around inflation rates and Fed hikes prevail. But this week's ratings is just a few days ahead of the Fed's September policy meeting could give the markets direction. If investors like what they hear, it could bring some much needed confidence to Wall Street. If they don't like the data, it might push stocks lower. Something to keep in mind with this. Um, when we see when we say flip-flop in here, basically, if I were to go back to the SPX charts, you guys can see on the monthly time frame, we have more or less been going sideways or so it seems for the last three months. That pretty much reiterates that part of the article right there. And the piece where it says it might push stocks lower. Well, to add to that, we are in bearish seasonality again, basically between roughly sometimes as early as the middle of October, all the way to the middle of or the middle of August, all the way to the middle of October is usually the most bear bearish time of the year for stocks. And September specifically is the worst year for stocks and crypto throughout the entire year. So it goes over a bunch of other stuff here. It basically says economists expect annual inflation is measured by the CPI index due out on Wednesday, which is tomorrow, to have reached 3.6 in 
3.6% in August, up from 3.2% in July. And then it talks about all this stuff, which I'll go over with you guys in the charts here in a minute. But um, so as of two months ago, the CPI reading was at 3%. And then last month it showed up for July at 3.2%. And then this month, basically they're expecting it to show up for August as 3.6%. If the Fed is convinced that they have an inflation under control, this is not something that they want to see. This is not something that they want to see. They do not want to see headline inflation going back up. And they definitely want to see core inflation coming down, which is still pretty elevated. So there's this article. I'll leave this in the description for you guys down below. Now, if we go over to the CME Fed watch tool... This is basically showing the probability for a rate hike by the Fed on September 20th. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and pull this up so you guys can see right here when the next FOMC meeting is going to be because it's important. If the Fed pauses rates or cuts rates, which seems less likely at this point, then the market's probably going to rally, which means that, you know, for you um, options covered call ETF people out there like myself included, you could see your distributions go up. But if the Fed has to hike rates because they feel like inflation's not coming down as much as they'd like and they have to hike again, there's a good chance that the markets could tank. Uh, nothing's set in stone, nothing's a guarantee, but we'll just kind of take it how it comes. So as you guys can see, the next FOMC meeting is on the 19th to the 20th. Let me make sure I got the right year here. Yeah, so the 19th to the 20th. If we look at the calendar here, you guys can basically see that's about a week from now. So the Fed will have this data from the CPI in their hands, along with all the, all the other metrics they look at before they have the FOMC meeting. And then once they've discussed it and whatever the case may be, they'll come out and tell the public, tell the markets like, hey, this is what we're going to do, what we're not going to do, and so on. Um, so tomorrow's CPI release and the FOMC meeting next week is going to be very important to the markets and the movement of the markets. So we'll go back here. You guys can see the FOMC meeting probability that they're going to raise rates is basically zero at this point. The uh, CME group, which again is older than the Fed, they've been around longer than the Fed has, basically estimates that there's a 93% chance that the Fed is going to keep rates the same. They're not going to change it. And an extremely low chance that they're going to raise rates. Um, and this is basically only about a week out from the next FOMC meeting. Now, what could change this is, let's say the estimate tomorrow is at 3.6% on headline inflation, and inflation instead comes out at like 3.8 or 4%. Basically, you should expect to see this number right here skyrocket and the chance that the Fed would put in another quarter basis point hike to massively increase, okay? And just to give you guys an example of how big of a deal this is, we're going to go out in terms of when the markets expect the Fed to start cutting rates. As you guys can see in November, uh, they're basically expecting the Fed to hold rates. They're not going to cut, but they're not going to raise. If we go out to December, and by the way, these are all FOMC meetings. This is not CPI, but they are correlated with one another. Again, the Fed's expected to not raise rates. If we go out to January, you guys can see that once again, the Fed is not expecting to cut rates from the markets. And still yet again, Fed's not expected to cut rates in March. And in May of 2024, once again, Fed's still not expected to cut rates. And here you have June of 2024, Fed's still not expected to cut rates by June. So basically, um, you got a 32% probability here. So basically in the month of July of next year, which is almost a whole year away from now, that's when the market expects the Fed to begin cutting rates, okay? Their first, or not not their first rate hike, their first rate cut in basically 10 months from now. This is kind of a big deal because, again, they'd be crushing demand. They're causing demand destruction with the intention of bringing inflation down. But 
has a negative effect on stocks. And, uh, you know, if you have a lot of money in stocks, well, uh, we all know that there's a chance, those of us that understand what CPI is and Fed rate hikes, there is a chance that those stocks could go down in value. Now, if we take a look at the CME futures projections for the settlement dates of the future, um, basically, I showed you guys this before. If you watched my video on the SPX overview for the month of September, you can basically pretty much see going out until September 2024, the markets are either going to be flat and or increase during that period of time. And if we go over here to the quotes, so pretty much um, December of 2023, you have 45.13. Prior settlement for September, 44.65. You take a look at the SPX, it's pretty much almost exactly to the number what the quote and estimate for September is. It's currently at 44.62. Uh, excuse me one second. I need to take a drink. I'm thirsty. A lot of talking here. So anyways, um, the CMA is projecting that by the end of the year, we'll be at 4,500. By March, we'll be at 4,566. June of next year, we'll be at 4,600. September, 4,660. And by the end of the year next year, we'll basically be almost back at all-time highs. So for you guys that need to know what futures are, I probably haven't described this to you before, but in simple terms, futures are derivative financial contracts that obligate parties to buy or sell an asset at a predetermined future date and price. The buyer must purchase or the seller must sell the underlying asset at the set price in the future, hence the name futures regardless of the current market price at the expiration date. So basically what this means is the big money, the whales, the billionaires, whoever it is that's doing this, okay? And the derivatives market, just so you guys know, is a $1.5 quadrillion market. It's bigger than any market in the entire world. It's absolutely massive. It pretty much dwarfs anything outside of it. So whoever is doing these contracts, they have to set a specific price at the expiration date. In the case of, let's say, the ES, which would be the S&P futures version of the SPX, the contract gets rolled forward and it expires every three months. So they basically would have to set the price for three months in the future, and that would be the determined price which is pretty much what you guys are seeing here. This is the expiration dates for each of those contracts, which have to be roll, rolled forward before the expiry date, because if it's not, then you're basically on the hook for uh, the notional value of however many contracts you traded into expiration. I would not recommend it. It's a really, really bad deal. Okay, so we're gonna go a little further here. Um, we'll talk about when futures came into existence. So basically, the first futures exchange was created in Japan in 1710. So you're talking almost, well, more than 300 years ago at this point. That was before, pretty much almost before the United States even existed, really. Um, and then we go even further back um, to London. Here you can see that in the London Metal Exchange, where these things were traded, or were created in uh, 1877, so that's almost, I would say, about 150 years. Uh, but the origins of the futures market trace all the back, all the way back to 1571. So you're talking roughly about five, 500 in, or 450 years or so. So a very old market, very big market. A lot of people trade it currently and have been for a long time. And if we take a look at here on the FOMC meeting calendar which is what this is for 2023. The FOMC meeting will be next week on the 19th to the 20th. Now let's take a look at the charts. So I have the SPX and the United States inflation rate month over month um, lined up next to each other. I have not gone over the monthly yet because when it comes to trading and investing and stuff like that, I usually stop at the weekly because there's no point looking at the monthly, but with macroeconomics, this is important. So as you guys can see, 
um, at the peak of the market. This was in November of 2021. This was when the Fed said that they were going to start raising rates. If we go back over here, you can see that inflation had gone up for a long time. And the Fed did not actually start raising rates until roughly about right here in March of 2022. And that was pretty much almost exactly when inflation peaked. So as you guys can see, based on the charts, that the Fed is actually a little bit behind the curve. Markets know this already. Again, the markets have been around longer than the Fed, so they kind of had have had decades to understand how the Fed works and how they operate and stuff like that. But as you guys can see here on the SPX, uh, pretty much almost right after inflation peaked, the SPX bottomed. So there is an inverse correlation here. And if you guys look carefully at the charts of inflation, this is headline inflation, by the way, not uh, core PCE inflation. You guys can see that this thing does not exactly go up in a straight line. Sometimes it goes up for a long time, then it kind of chops around, goes up. And same thing on the downside. It doesn't really go down perfectly or up perfectly. So right here, we were sitting at 3%, as you guys can see in June. Then we moved up to 3.2%. So I told you guys I was going to talk about oil. So one of the reasons why CPI might actually come out at expectations tomorrow, which is 3.6%, is because of oil. So we're going to take a look at the oil charts. We're going to scroll all the way down here. As soon as I find it. So as you guys can see, oil has basically reversed course. Um, this is the futures version of oil. This is not actual oil, but this is what I use to track the prices of oil. So as you guys can see, the price reversed here. Um, let's actually, since we're done with inflation at this point, let's take a look at the weekly on these. All right, there we go. So you guys can see all the different metrics going on here. You can see right here... Um, on the MACD death cross we had up here at the top when oil had basically hit like around $130 a barrel, pretty much went straight down from there. Um, but basically around June when CPI bottomed, as you guys saw on the charts for inflation, oil has pretty much gone up from there. Well, why is that? Basically, what's going on here is OPEC decided at some point in time that they were going to cut oil production. Now, everybody that drives cars, or at least most people that drives cars right now, at least until some point in the future when people start, you know, everybody in society is driving electric cars, most people right now are using gas-powered cars or ICE cars, okay, which means that they have to pay for gas. So you have a sustained level of demand on gasoline, aka oil, and you have production cuts on oil which means high demand, low supply. Therefore, the price of oil per barrel increases. And what could that do to inflation? Well, energy, aka oil, is actually a metric in the inflation readout that the uh, BLS has. Basically, that by itself could increase the, the uh, inflation rate on the headline sector. Um, and that's not really what we want to see. So as you guys can see, it bottomed out here and then it moved up. What I would like to see for gas prices to come down and for inflation to stay flatlined over a long period of time is basically for oil to pretty much get stuck between the $63 range all the way up to 84 but not go any higher than that. If this thing goes above and stays above 84 which it has recently, uh, that's definitely not a good side for inflation, okay? And by the way, just so you know, oil and gasoline is beyond the Fed's control. So they may have to tighten to even more to offset the effects of rising oil prices. Now, one last metric I want to look at with you guys so you guys can understand more of this um, as we move forward with this channel is the core inflation so core inflation, as you guys can see, has not been as aggressive to the downside as headline inflation. 
peaked out at about 6%, 6.6%. Now it's currently down to 4.7%. But again, neither headline inflation nor core inflation is on par with the Fed's expectations, which would be roughly around 2%, maybe not exactly, maybe 2.5%. So the markets think that headline inflation is going to go to 3.6% and core inflation is going to go to 4.5%. Well, here's how that could affect you guys as investors. Basically, if oil keeps going up, if inflation on both sides keep going up, that could suppress the price of stocks because the markets already know that the Fed's going to have to raise rates more, which is going to create more pressure on the economy. Could least it could potentially lead to increased or to increased unemployment, um, because again, basically how that works is, you know, people have to go spend money for products at these companies in order for companies to make money, and then the companies have to sell to the people in order to raise the profit to buy more products to sell to the people, and it's kind of a, a, a revolving door, basically is what it is. Um, if there's less people spending money in the economy, that means that there's less money that these companies can make, which means that they have to tighten their budgets, which means that the stock price will probably go down because, again, they're not making as much money as they were previously before the Fed really started cranking up the tightening cycle. And it's just it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So that's what we're trying to avoid here. Hopefully neither one of these inflation metrics go back up. It goes back down to two to three percent. Fed's happy and they say, okay, fine, we're going to go ahead and cut rates. Um, We're done at this point. You know, we're going to cut rates. We're going to go back into at some point our quantitative easing process, which for those of you guys who don't know, quantitative easing is basically when the Fed, instead of rolling off their balance sheet and selling assets off of their balance sheet, they're now buying assets to put on their balance sheet, which is bullish because that means they're buying mortgage-backed securities, they're buying bonds, and that helps increase stock prices over time. And again, you know, stock prices can only go so much down so much before eventually the companies have to start protecting their own capital and they may have to end up issuing some dividend cuts, which hopefully that doesn't happen, but we'll just have to wait and see. So Anyways, I know this is a long video, but it's very important. CPI is critical right now to whether the markets go up and down, whether you get paid dividends or not. Okay, you guys need to understand this kind of stuff. So, hope you enjoyed this. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see y'all later. Peace.